much and good morning everybody and welcome to this morning's Revit Architecture webinar. My name is Paul Klein, I'm the AEC Business Unit Director at CadPoint and I'm joined today by um, our application specialist Steve Musitano who specialises in Revit Architecture. Uh, so the agenda for today is um, brief and to the point on purpose because we've got, we've got you for an hour uh, so we want to make the most of your time. Uh, effectively, what we'll be doing um, shortly, Steve will run uh, a couple of polls, some online polls for you to reply to. Um, the point of that being is really to find out what you and the audience are using technology-wise, be that Autodesk or competitive software. That helps us, if you like, tweak the product demonstration um, to the audience that have logged in today. So Steve will go through those shortly. Um, we'll then move into literally a handful of slides, really just to position what we mean uh, from an Autodesk perspective around BIM or model-based design using Revit architecture. Um, as soon as we've got through that, we're then really going to spend the majority of the time focused on the product. We know from previous feedbacks from the webinars we've been doing over the last couple of years uh, that the attendees you know, like to spend the majority of the time looking at how um, model-based design is going to help benefit their practice. Um, we'll then go from that uh, back to myself, uh, where I'll then talk to you about the process of moving from uh, potentially a traditional 2D-based design process to a model-based design process, uh, and what we do as the uh, Autodesk uh, value-added reseller to support you in that transition with both the uh, technology available in terms of the software and the support services that we provide as well. And then we'll effectively um, say if there's any burning questions we might answer a couple and then we'll literally wrap the session up. So um, over to you Steve, I think mean, that's pretty well mixed. Much of yeah. Cool, thanks Paul. Uh, just going to put you on mute. Excellent. Okay, so as Paul said, a couple of polls. We'll launch the first one. Um, this is just a yes, no answer, just to get a feeling for the audience we have here. So are you an existing Revit user? So we've got 40, 50, 60, 80. I'll just leave it a couple of seconds. 90, it's pretty close, 98, we'll leave it there. So just close the poll. Um, let me just publish those results. So typical, um, you know, sort of 60-40 or just over 60-40 split, which is exactly where we're, we're looking at. So the majority of you are not Revit users. There are some out there that have got it, possibly not implementing it correctly or, or, or not implementing it fully, I should say. Okay, so let's just um, look at the next poll. So this is multiple choice. So this is just digging a bit deeper. The Revit users that are there, um, what version are you running? Is it the current or previous or an older version, like 2014 or older? Um, and then what other software are you using? So is it other Autodesk uh, type software? So AutoCAD, AutoCAD LT, AutoCAD Architecture, Civil 3D, it could be something like that. Or a non-Autodesk product such as MicroStation, Vectorworks, ArchiCAD and the like. Okay, so just leave it a couple of seconds longer. We're up to 80. We're not quite as far as we were before. Okay, so I'll cap it there, and again, just look at the results, and this is pretty typical for, um, share those, uh, just pretty typical for um, what we would expect to see. So, you know, the majority are using um, other Autodesk-based software. We've got a few on an older version, but most of you on the uh, current or previous versions. Okay, so superb. Let's just hide that. Just make sure you're seeing. What I'm seeing, there we go, sorry about that. Okay, so what we'll do now is just, as Paul said, run through the PowerPoint, um, just to introduce building information modeling and what it's about. So it is an integrated uh, process built on, the, on coordinated reliable information about the project from design through construction um, into operations. And that's the key thing here. We're not just talking about the design part, although that's the area we're gonna focus on today. BIM is about from concept through to delivery of a, a construction um, and then managing uh, that construction through its life cycle. It doesn't just stop at handover. Um, the area that we're looking today is Revit architecture and primarily we're going to be looking at the design processes 
when we're using Revit and how they work and how they differ from a, a traditional 2D type of approach. So the way Revit goes about um, working is, yes, you are working with a 3D model. We're not, we can't get away from that because the 3D model is the coordination tool to, for delivery of the information in our traditional views that we're looking at. So plans, sections, elevations, uh, schedules and the like. Um, the 3D model coordinates that data, even though we'll be working in any of those views. And prim primarily, you'll see me working in a traditional plan section elevation type of approach. Um, but the key here is that we're adding uh, content or components which are uh, retrospective of the real world. They're, they're representing things like walls, doors, windows, floors, uh, furniture, and the like. And you're placing those within a 3D environment. It's just the views understand what to deliver in the relevant uh, configuration that you've got them set for. So that could be a, a working sketch mode or a final output mode for plotting purposes or output purposes. So you can configure those views to exactly how you want them to be displayed. And we'll go through a bit of that in the, in the uh, demonstration. The important thing is then that you're annotating these 2D views for the construction purposes. And the views are what manage all of the data together with the 3D model. Um, so what are the benefits, what's the return on investment of implementing something like this? Um, these are some real world figures taken from people that have implemented uh, BIM and Revit specifically. Um, and, you know, some of the feedback that we're getting from them, you know, different uh, reductions in time, 80% reduction in time taken to generate cost estimates uh, with an accuracy of, of within 3%. The one that really gets me is the bottom one. So up to 20% efficiency savings when you're implementing this type of approach, you know, and if you relate that to your working week, you know, 20% is an extra day. And um, that's quite astounding, I thought. Um, and people think that that's you know, really easily attainable once you've got these processes in, in place and you're using this software to generate your construction documentation. Okay, so one other thing that you need to be aware of um, is something called Revit LT. Um, Paul may allude to it a little bit more later on. Um, Revit LT is an introduction product um, it's not the full version of Revit, and there are some differences, as you can see on the screen. It's something that you, you know, and these questions you really need to ask yourself um, prior to purchasing the LT product. LT isn't the full BIM-enabled um, application. The reason being, it's not got any uh, capability for multiple people working on a single project at the same time. And that's the whole essence of BIM, is that multiple people can feed in information to the single model um, that you're working on for the relevant discipline at the same time. It's an active model. Revit LT doesn't support that. Also, it doesn't support, like any of the LT products, Autodesk LT products, uh, network licensing, so you can't share licensing. It's one product per person. There's no concept or freeform modeling tools, so any of the concept tools, um, a bit like the sketchup -y type tools that you've got out there, um, none of those are available in the LT product. Um, there's no rendering capability, which is very important. All there is is shading. Um, there's no structural or MEP or mechanical electrical um, piping content supplied with Revit LT, so it's really, really uh, geared towards the architectural approach. Um, and there's no point cloud support. So um, 3D uh, point clouds, uh, which are available from scanning processes now, Revit LT doesn't support those file formats, or it doesn't allow you to uh, import those file formats. Now, you know, you may be wondering, you know, well, what's Revit LT about then? Why, why is it out there? Well, it's class as limited technology, and these are some of the limits. It's not exclusively all of the limitations. Um, and I would suggest you go to the Autodesk website to look at a comparison chart against Revit if you are interested in the product, just to see you know, what it really can't do. Um, it's geared towards a single user environment, or what we call lonely BIM. So <clears throat> there are people out there that don't necessarily um, interact outside. Um, they may be a, a, a single user um, working on one specific project at a time. And in that respect, Revit LT may suit your needs. It's also a great training tool to get people up to speed on the processes of Revit before they launch into a full uh, program using uh, the full product. 
Um, and of course, it is a lot cheaper than the full Revit cost. So it's something to bear in mind. Um, again, I think Paul will take up a little bit more later on uh, when we finished off, just to, just to put LT in perspective. Okay, so that's all I was going to do um, with regards to PowerPoint. Um, I'm just going to switch over my screens to my Revit, and we'll take you through the demonstration. Let me just set up a couple of things. Here we go. Okay, so what we've got on the screen at the moment um, is an existing um, construction, which I'm going to be working on. This is a, a school extension. It's a sixth form and music block extension to a school in Langley, or just outside uh, London or Slough area. Um, it was a project that was um, primarily done in LT, actually AutoCAD LT is a 2D approach, but um, they implemented Revit on it as a, um, like a pilot project um, in this case. Um, so the project's not complete in Revit, but you'll see some of the data that I'm going to go through. You'll notice in Revit that um, the views on the screen are displaying information in, a, in relative form. So if we just take a, a, a run through these, the top screen here is a, what I would call a sketch plan view. So it's a working view. It's where I'm going to start adding information to uh, the construction or, or you know, changing the design, that type of thing. The view below is a presentation view. So this is a bit like paper space in, in an AutoCAD type of environment. So we've got um, a title block. We've got viewports, which are placed onto the sheet, uh, which consist of a ground floor, a first floor, and a schedule. And all of that data is coordinated relative to uh, the model information. So the schedule is displaying relevant square meterage of different rooms or circulation within the model. And those views have been configured to display the rooms by color based on a, a, a color um, scheme that we've got defined in the bottom left-hand corner there. So that's the difference between sort of a working view above and a, a, a presentation view or a delivery view below. Down the right-hand side of the screen, we've got some additional views. So we've got a, a section. Um, and the importance here is to understand that when we're working in 3D, we need to manage our vertical axis. Um, and the way that we do that in Revit is by using what we call level markers. So the levels in a project control datums in the vertical axis. Um, in this project, I've got them representing finished floor levels, so ground first. We've also got some levels here to assign to the underside of roof and the top of the parapet wall. There are other levels in here that I've just cleared them down to make this view a little bit cleaner. Um, and those datums are important because we can actually manage the model by editing values in here. And this is what we call parametric design or parametric change. So I can actually click on this value and make a change to the model and it will change the physical floor level and all of the elements relative to that level. So, you know, imagine trying to do that in a 2D world is really, really difficult, especially the coordination of all of the drawings or views that you've got relative to the change you're making. And hopefully you'll see when I go through the demonstration how Revit manages that automatically. It's things we don't have to think about. Uh, below that is um, an elevational view. Um, this is a, a work in progress. It's a view from the south. We've got shadows turned on. We've got, um, it's a color fill. So it's picking up the colors from the materials that have, have started to be assigned uh, to the different components. So we've got the sort of this pinkish brickwork. We've got like a render color and then another uh, sort of orange render uh, representational of this uh, atrium wall. Um, and we've also got some information in the background. Now, the background information is actually a DWG. So Revit, from uh, being an Autodesk product, is able to import and export AutoCAD DWG seamlessly. It uses the AutoCAD uh, capabilities or the AutoCAD DWG capabilities within the product. So it means that we can import and export data in a DWG format and a DXF format. Um, so you can start to supply information to third parties in that format if you wish, or bring site information, um, you know, this sort of um, information into the background to enhance the views that you've got. Also in this view, we have got some trees in the foreground, 2D elements, um, and these are blocks that have come from AutoCAD. So basically, um, because we've got the DWG reader within Revit, we've got the ability to import DWG line work information 
especially in you know like libraries of blocks that you may have um, and and start to utilize those and that's what I've done here that's why we can actually see the outline is green and brown because it's come directly from AutoCAD and we can create those as a Revit object and then start to place those around in our views um, uh, the last view that we've got on the screen here is a schedule um, this is a really basic window schedule um, of the first floor so it's listing all of the windows from the first floor the type of window that they are um, some relative sizes associated to each instance of the window um, and then a, an image um, name relative to an image file that I can place on a sheet if I was to place this schedule onto a, a working sheet so we'll actually get a little a graphic picture of the window style as well so this is some basic information that's taken off of the schedule um, and the schedule is live with the model and just to prove that if I come down to where is it there window number seven I've highlighted window number seven in the schedule and hopefully you've noticed that the uh, window has also been highlighted in all of these other views we can just see them selected here with a double arrow in all of these other views because it's the same object it doesn't matter where you select the component it's the same object in in the uh, in the project if I come up into my working view and zoom in slightly we can then see some uh, parameters some dimensions temporary dimensions associated to the position of that window relative to where it is in the wall and also my properties palette over on the left hand side of the screen here has updated with information about that window so we can see that it's the triple casement window it's relative to the first floor it has a, a datum a, a sill height relative to the the first floor datum it's got a tag number a mark ID and it's also got a head height and this is some of the information that I'm extracting into the schedule here automatically now if I was to make a change for instance if I was to, to delete the window so I'm just going to press delete and we can see all of those views have instantly been changed they've been updated and are fully coordinated with each other so I haven't had to do anything else it doesn't matter where I work I can make those changes and be assured that all of the information continually stays coordinated so we just undo that and bring the window back again okay so for the rest of the demo what we're going to do is basically work through um, adding some information uh, to the model I'm going to work up the internal area here um, make this into three separate rooms put some doors in there um, we'll also put the room objects and uh, color the rooms up to give us a, a finished view here um, and I'll keep this view on the screen just to show you what's happening in both views at the same time what we then do is start to look at some documentation so we'll cut a section down through the model and then start to detail that and work that information up um, producing a call out and then we'll look at some of the the niceties if you like some of the 3d stuff and the renderings towards the end so first of all what we want to do is just um, effectively partition this area off we want it to be three separate rooms so what I need to do is draw a wall to do that now within Revit there's a whole load of different ways of working um, depending on the view you, that you're in depends on the tools that are given to you to work on I'm in a, a plan view uh, a, a working view so I basically get virtually all of the tools available to me we can see that um, along the top of the screen we've actually got the tools um, tabbed into different uh, industry types if you like so we've got architectural tools which is the ones I'm going to focus on but within the product I'm using the full um, uh, Revit product from building design suite I also get all the structural tools and the system tools and remember when I spoke about Revit LT these are the areas that you you wouldn't get these two tabs basically of um, components that you can add you only get the architectural tab and some of the stuff on here is also limited as well um, so what we want to do is add a wall so I'm going to pick on the wall tool and what that does is changes my menu system to display the types of commands associated with the wall that I'm going to construct or draw um, the other thing that I've got the ability to do is select the type of wall that I want to create so we get a little drop down list here and I can go up and down this list to select any of the walls that are currently in this project now you'll notice that the the naming I've used here anything with an SM in front of it is my initials and it just shows you that I've created these specifically for use in this project so the ones up here are the default content that comes with Revit with the particular template that I've started with 
um, and then the walls down here are walls that I've created specifically to meet the client needs um, on this particular project. So the, the wall I'm going to use is this uh, very simple block 215 is the name of it. If we just go in and have a quick look to see how uh, the, uh, the wall is put together, you can see that it's made up of three separate components. Um, we've got the, the central main block work, a masonry unit, and then we've got a plaster finish on each side. So the exterior side is at the top, as it says here, interior side at the bottom. So we can build up um, cavity wall type constructions or rain screen type constructions, whatever you really want. What we're doing is defining each component within that wall structure. And this all also applies to the way we build up floors, ceilings, and roofs as well. It's in a layered type of approach. So here, just to keep it simple, we've got three separate components. They've got a function to define how they work, so whether it's a structural element or a finish element. Um, and there's a couple of other elements as well, substrates, thermal air layer, and a membrane layer. Um, we've got a material to define what those components are representing. So in this case, we've actually defined them. Um, early, you know, early design, you may not know this information. And at any time you can come back and either swap the wall out for a different construction, or you can build the construction up to meet uh, the requirements. So here we've actually got um, a component specified. This is finishes interior plaster. Again, this comes directly from the Autodesk um, supplied content or material content, which is used across the Autodesk products. Um, let's have a look at the masonry block work. Here we go. So masonry block work, we can see that it's got a number of different configurations for the graphic representation. So how it's going to be shaded, any hatch patterns for the surface or for the cut view. So if we wanted to apply a hatch pattern, I could pick on here and then go down and find the relevant hatch pattern associated to a, a surface or an elevational view, if you like. What we've also got the ability to do is define materials, so real world materials for rendering. So even if we're rendering inside Revit or we were to export this out to 3D Studio Max or Showcase or something like that, the materials that we define here will be rep uh, represented correctly in those other products. So there's a full workflow as well from Revit to other applications within the Autodesk suite. And more importantly now, it's not just a, um, a design tool for producing construction drawings. We've got the ability to um, assign thematic information, so thermal information associated to components. And this data can then be used on things like heating and cooling loads if we if the uh, services guys were looking at um, uh, an MEP solution or a, an M&E solution for their for the specific design. They can actually start to take in what the uh, thermal properties are for the different components we're adding, because that will have a bearing on um, you know the heating and cooling loads of this particular building. And that's the I part, if you like, to, of of BIM. It's the intelligence that you've got to add, or you've got the ability to add to your to your different models. So the last element here is the thickness. So this is defining how wide effectively the each component representation is. And if I wanted to change this again, this is a parameter. If I just type in 450, for instance, it immediately makes a change. We can see that graphical change. And if I was to pick OK, it would then update all of the walls in my project with this change. So, you know, there are some processes that people need to understand prior to implementing this and that would be learnt through training you know so you would go through and you would change the type or duplicate um, the type of component that you want and then you would make a change to the duplication unless it was actually a modification you were doing to the the physical element that you wanted to work on okay so we've got our walls um, specified now it's just a case of drawing it and you'll notice as I move my cursor around it's actually starting to pick up temporary dimensions to place the start point now what I'm going to do is just snap it to this wall and just drag it horizontally across to this other wall and you'll notice that it's automatically finding a connection point so Revit draws that wall and it cleans up those connections for me so really quickly I can just drop those walls in and it's producing what I would expect to see now, the cynical ones out there will say, yeah, OK, but you've got construction there and how's it joined up all of that stuff underneath? If I change the display level to medium, um, what we can now see is how that wall is being uh, cleaned up and we can see the hatch patterns relative to um, 
the graphic representation and you can see that it's you know it's wrapped around the plaster finish at both ends okay so depending on the construction depends on how it does that wrapping and we've got some controls over that as well okay so we've got our two walls so I've just haphazardly placed them so maybe we wanted to place them accurately so at any time any object can be selected and we can define the position of those objects relative to other objects in the model or we can use things like alignment so I'm going to use an alignment with the window pick the opening of the window pick the face of the wall and we can make that alignment nice and accurately really accurately like that and really quick and again if I was to pick on do that again if I was to pick on that wall it would then feedback dimensions which I can snap to um, and then set to a specific size if I wanted to okay so some walls placed in the in the model you'll notice that the the uh, presentation view has also been updated and it's also added the shadows automatically um, I haven't had to regenerate any of that information it's, it just produces it automatically next thing I want to do is add some doors so I've got some doors already here which I want to um, duplicate so I can just hover over the door it will tell me there's a, a little um, pop-up that tells me the type of door that is that may not be visible on your webinar um, what I'm going to do is right mouse click and I'm just going to say create similar so that's now duplicated the door on my cursor and we can see from the properties palette over here that's the type of door that I selected um, and the particular size if I wanted to change it I could go to the drop down list and change the door style if I wanted to as soon as I hover over a wall um, it will then show me the door position otherwise it's a no entry sign and then it's down to um, my understanding to place it where I want it to go so we get these in place dimensions so I can snap it to where I want it to go I can move the cursor depending on the side of the wall uh, for the opening and I can use a space bar on the keyboard just to control the handing so I want a hundred mil offset opening to the inter interior of the room and we can then click and place that door so again just do the other one and the other one so we've got the three doors in place now if I wanted to change the style of that door for instance again at any time I can change you know the handing the positioning of that door I could change the style of the door say I wanted it to be um, this one here which is a, a double vision panel so we're going to change it to that style of door it's now changed that door it's highlighted we can see that change now we can't see that in plan view because the door representation is pretty much the same if we wanted to see that in elevation well I can do a very quick elevational view pick on the elevation tool just drop the elevation marker down internally looking at the wall we want to uh, view like so double pick and we can now see those two different door types and again if I really wanted to change that uh, door here you know I can work in this view we can see it's highlighted I can go to the properties palette and I can make that change very very quickly and we've now got two of the same types of doors so that's great um, the other thing is maybe scheduling the doors how you know how do we get a door schedule from this very very easily because everything knows what it is it's a knows it's a door and it knows the mark and the numbering of the door now before we do the schedule it might be a good idea to place some tags down on the doors um, so the way we do that is go to annotate we're then going to use the tag oops wrong one sorry tag tag all there we go um, this lists all of the types of tags that are loaded um, for automatic placement so we're going to use a door tag we're going to use number only and we're just going to pick OK and it just goes and tags up all of those doors in the order that they were placed so you notice that there's a difference a jump effectively from some of the existing doors that are there to the new doors that I've placed in now we can do a renumbering renumbering is probably easier to do in a schedule so let's create the schedule first of all so I'm just going to do a schedule um, schedules um, are based on anything that's 3d in the model so this is a list of all the categories that we can extract so we want doors once I've selected doors I can then pick on the type of fields that the op the fields associated to the actual component type so what I want to pull off probably is family and type 
Um, I probably want the level that the door's on, the mark of the door, as in the number. Uh, what else do we want? The width. Did I get the width out? No. Where's the width gone? Let me just go back because something's not listed there properly. So let's just run that again. So door schedule, there we go. So we want family and type. We want the height. We want the mark. We want the level. And we want the width. Sorry about that. I think I must have picked a multi-category multi schedule previously. Okay, so we've got the objects that we want specifically for doors. What I'm going to do is just move these around. So we're going to move the mark to the top and level to the bottom. So top down is equal to left to right when we read the schedule. Pick OK, and it then creates a schedule for us for the whole project. So that's all the doors in the project. Now, if I wanted to go and find a door, again, I can go down to the door type and I can then say highlight it in the model and it will then go and find that door for me. Again, it's just proving this coordination. If I wanted to split my um, schedule into separate floors, so we can say in here, first floor, door schedule, what I'm now going to do is just filter off um, some of the information. So we're going to say filter by or I should say sort by level, beg your pardon, wrong one, filter by level. If the level equals the first floor, then show that information. And again, we've also got the, oops, we've also got sorting as well. So I could sort by the level or sort by the mark is probably better. So it will just put it into numeric order. So we can now see where that jump is. So again, I could come in here and say, actually, this one should be 28. Now, as soon as I've done that, what it's done is actually popped up a message saying that elements have duplicate marks. So we can see that there's a num another number uh, 28 door. So again, I could investigate that further and, and then do a, a better renumbering job. But what you're seeing is that what Revit's doing is returning information to you, intelligent information about the model. Um, it won't stop me from changing the number because I might be going through a renumbering process, but it's actually, it actually knows where those errors are. Um, what we'll do is put that one back to, what was it, 50, I think it was, like so. We'll just leave those alone for a moment. Okay, so we've seen how um, we've created the some walls, we've put some doors in, windows work exactly the same way. Uh, we've created an internal elevation. Now, with internal elevations, we can actually develop that further and we can create um, room uh, identity sheets. So we could just drop the elevation into a room. We can then turn on the orientation for each um, view, north, south, east, west, um, and then configure those views to exactly how we want to deliver them. So just like this one, we can then enhance that further or add dimensional information, tagging information, textual data to enhance that view. Um, so moving on, what we're going to do is the rooms just to finish this view off. So what I need to do is identify um, what these rooms represent based on the color scheme that I've got set up down here. So the way we do that is we're just going to drop in a room object into each one of these. So you can see that a number of the rooms have been defined already. That's what's given us the, the color representation. So I'm just going to drop in the default object of room into each one of these using the tag alignment tool to just align those tags for me. And then it's just a matter of renaming these to be um, what they should be. So this is uh, classroom two. Classroom three, and this one is private study, like so. And what you can see it's doing is just picking up the colors based on the scheme that I defined and uh, color filling those rooms in this presentation sheet, which has been configured to deliver the information in that way. What you'll notice is that the room tags aren't displayed in this view. Because the rooms weren't created originally when I created this view and its annotation, it's something that I just need to add. So it's just a matter of going into um, tag the rooms, 
and I can just come in here and manually just drop in those tags and it's just repeating the information that's already there. The importance here is that this room object that I've placed is actually measuring information associated to the geom geometry that's encasing it. So as we can see here, it's actually measuring the area off as 50.29 square meters. There's a perimeter to it, and there's also a volume to it. So it's actually measuring from where the floor to the ceiling is and that volumetric information. And again, that data could be reused um, for heating and cooling loads um, based on the number of persons uh, that will occupy this room. Um, so we've done that, we've done that. The last thing really is just to look at the, the schedule because where we've been working and placing those rooms, the schedule has automatically been updated. We can see classroom two and classroom three and it's pulled off that information. It's also calculated as part of the schedule the percentage of floor total that each one of these rooms takes up. So you can see that Revit's coordinating and delivering a lot of information as we're starting to build up uh, the construction of the, of the design. Okay, so the next thing that we're going to look at is really the, where we go from here, so creating documentation and such like. So the next thing I'm going to do is drop a section down through the area that we've been working and then start to um, give you an understanding of how we deliver that data and uh, how we create uh, call outs and that sort of stuff and then placing some, uh, placing this information on sheets. So to create the section, what I use is the section tool. So I'm actually going up to the QAT. I tend to use my, um, I t tend to configure my QAT quick access toolbar to here. Normally it would be up here and I just think it's out of the way there. People don't use it. This is the only part in Revit that you can actually configure um, to be customized per user. So I've configured a number of the modify commands. So some of the modify tools here I've put into the QAT just to make it easier to access. So I'm going to use the section tool, one of the tools that I've added. Just pick on it there rather than going into the view and then pick section. Exactly the same process. Drop the section line down where I want it to cut through the model. So that's now created some geometry, but more importantly, what it's done is added a new view to my project. Now, we haven't mentioned this up until now. Um, as well as the pro uh, properties palette, we've also got our project browser. And our project browser lists all of the views that are created that make up this project. So if you relate it to an AutoCAD type of world, you know, you might be looking at one drawing, um, and each one of these views effectively is each one of those drawings that makes up your, your um, AutoCAD set of files. All of this is contained in one environment. So each one of these is a separate view. And all of this is categorized, so we can find it nice and easily. It's based into floor plans, ceiling plans, 3D views, elevations, sections. Now, where I've created this section, what we've done is created a, it's created a new default name, section one. Just to prove that that is the section, if I just double click the section to take me to that view, we can see that it's now highlighted as the, um, the active view. If I just tile these views, so I'm just going to use some keyboard shortcuts, WT for window tile and then ZA for zoom all the viewports to extents. So we can now see those two views. Um, if I pick on the section line, you can see that the crop region, the window that's actually controlling the data, being delivered to that view is actually being controlled by this green boundary line. So if I extend it here, we can see that it's capturing more information. And I can even you know, change the view direction and then drag this back so we don't need to capture quite as much information uh, that we've got there. So that's now captured the section that I actually want to create. Um, also, we can control how the geometry is displayed here. So I can just cut that back. So I know a lot of um, a lot of practices don't like the section line cutting all the way through. And we can also do dogleg or um, uh, split sections within Revit. So this is like a dogleg across the wall there and then back down through the uh, stairwell. So a number of different ways we can build up our, our section information and display it in the relevant view. The other thing to notice is none of the sections here have actually got any information within their bubbles because at the moment those sections don't appear on sheets which is what we'll be coming to uh, shortly. 
And as soon as I place those views on sheets, these bubbles automatically get um, processed and updated with the relevant view number and sheet number that this particular section appears on. And again, I'll show you that in just a second. As this one here, we can see that it's already configured. So this particular section view appears as view number one and it's on sheet 106, so fully coordinated. But again, I'll come to that in more detail in just a second. So we can configure exactly how big a crop region we want to capture. Um, and I can turn that crop region on and off. Again, each view within Revit has got a number of tools along the bottom of the screen. So if I want to turn off my crop region, I can say hide crop region, pick on that tool and it just turns it off. Um, likewise, I can control um, each element within the view as well. So if I wanted to turn off specific items like this level marker, I can actually right mouse click and then just say hide in view the element or the category. So if I turn the element off, it's the individual item. If I turn the category off, it's like turning off a layer of all of these level markers. So if I turn the category off, all the level markers turn off. So all of that information is controlled within our visibility graphics. And this is per viewport, so per view. The controls that I've got here are controlling the information to display per view. The level markers are annotation category. So if I come down to here and I look at, there we go, levels. And again, if I turn levels off here and say apply, it was doing the same thing as doing it in the actual view itself. So we've got full control over how we display information in each viewport as well. And this is probably as nearer to the layer manager that you get um, in, in an AutoCAD type of environment. The difference here is that everything has a name. You can't create your own names here, your own um, category names. Everything is predefined regardless of whether you're working on um, an architectural view, a structural um, uh, uh, constructural project or a, um, an M&E project. We can filter the different industry types. So we're just looking at the relevant information, but everybody's working off the same playing field. So no, there's no layer management as such. Okay, so we've got our view. Um, the other thing that we might want to do is change the um, scale representative to paper. So usually this would be a one to 50. So we'll change it one to 50. We can see what that's done is scaled all the line weights, uh, text sizes, hatch pattern scales, that sort of stuff automatically. And we can change it to a medium level of detail. And we start to then see the construction of the components that we're adding. Now, you know, that's a good starting point. A lot of people would probably enhance this to a little bit more detail. And again, in good Blue Peter fashion, I've already got a section that I've worked up with some additional detail information. Now, this is probably as far as I would go with regards to detail per, um, per scale. Um, and, you know, I, I probably wouldn't want to put much more information on the, on the, on this particular level of, um, you know, this particular level of detail for the, for the section. I would start to break this down further, such as long wall call outs and particular detail call outs, which is what we'll look at in just a second. So the way that this information has been added is by um, adding additional 2D components over the top of the 3D generated view. So this, this is the 3D generated view that we created in the section. And what we've done is enhance that with additional 2D information. So things like insulation, um, block work, uh, we've got lintels in here, cavity closers and that sort of thing. And that's all information that's come from our library of information that's supplied with Revit. So just to show you very quickly how that's done, this wall here, you can see the left-hand side has been detailed with a, a repeating detail of 100 mil block work. On the right-hand side, it's still the generic wall. So if we wanted to detail this up, what we would do is go to annotate. We'd use a, a detail component. So we're going to use a repeating detail. We're going to select the type of detail that we want. So this is 140 mil block work. And you can see anything that you want to create as a repeating object in a direction, you know, things like brickwork in plan section, stud work, purlins, that sort of stuff. Anything that's repeated, we can create as a repeating detail. So I'm going to use 140 mil block work, snap where I want it to start, and it's 
the details made up of a block and a mortar joint and it's just a matter of then defining where I want that to go picking and placing and it's detailed is added that additional information to this particular view um, so to take it a little bit further we just close down these two views behind um, what we're going to do is create a call out of the footing detail here <clears throat> so what we do is pick on the view tool pick on call out and then it's just a matter of capturing the information that we want for this particular call out so we can see the bubbles not annotated yet we'll come to that again in just a second this is the detail that we've actually captured um, within the browser it's automatically created this detail here which is uh, derived from my 1 to 50 section AA and it's called it call out 1 so I'm just going to rename this and call this one a 1 to 10 footing detail if I I can either double click it from here to open the detail or I could double click the bubble to take me to the same place so that's the detail and you can see that it's actually quite a lot different than the view that it's derived from now the reason for that is as I said the detail information the 2d data only resides within the view that you draw it so what we want to do is duplicate that information so this is a CAD system after all so what we can do is we can do a selection and then using intelligent filter within Revit because everything's named we can immediately find out what we want so we want detail items insulation line work let's just test that we apply that filter and we can see that's the information that I want to capture pick OK we're going to copy it to our clipboard come into this view here and then we're just going to paste it aligned to the same place and we can see that we've just duplicate that duplicated that 2d data into this particular view you know we haven't had to redraw it as such it's just a duplication now I can set my scale set it to 1 to 10 and we can see that physical change to the detail turn the crop region off um, and then we might want to start um, annotating this uh, with some dimensional information so we just drop some dimensions in here so I'm just using the tab key to find the faces of the floor so we've got some dimensions like so we may want to then put in um, some keynote information so this is a bit like spec notes so I'm going to use a material spec note and depending on the object that I pick depends on the note that appears because it's actually pulling again that information from the object itself like so now this is based on a keynote table that's supplied with Revit when you install the UK version it installs um, a version of the MBS major clauses as we can see here um, MBS have actually written their own plugin for Revit so if you're using the MBS um, I can't remember what the current version is but spec writer effectively or the new version of it you can actually connect spec writer directly to Revit to generate um, the the spec information for you so again that's created our call out and it's added some additional annotation to it what we'd want to do now is probably add this information to sheets so let's just close that view down we'll drop that one back we'll open up a sheet let's open up typical sections first of all so these are some pre-configured views with um, some a1 uh, title views on them already so this one's already been set up with a, a particular name typical sections um, and, a, and a number a 104 and what we're going to do is just drop in our views onto this so this is a sectional view so it's just a matter of finding the relevant sections and then dragging and dropping them onto the view and we can see that they're reproduced exactly how we've created them over here <clears throat> just to show that it's not uh, all smoke and mirrors this is the section one that I created again I'll just drop that in it's a little bit big but we can see you know that's just being reproduced exactly how I created it if we go on to um, our details let's just open up my detail sheet there it is there we do exactly the same thing go and find our call out 1 to 10 footing detail the thing to look out for here is this bubble so as soon as I add that detail to the sheet we can see that it's numbered it as uh, view number one which indeed it is and it's on sheet 
A107, which it is. Now, if any of this information changes, for instance, we want to renumber our sheets to, I don't know, D500 or something, I can do that and that coordination stays in place. It just updates with the relevant information. So again, there's no uncoordinated um, information within a Revit uh, project. What do we got? 21. Okay, so let's just look at some of the um, nice bits towards the end, if you like. Let's just go back to a site showing some of the existing views. So this is um, a site view like so, and um, with some existing buildings. So this is mass objects. So this is a bit like the concept um, objects that SketchUp produces. And these are, again, the objects that Revit LT can't produce. So basic forms that you place within the model. So these are being used as um, existing buildings. Um, if I wanted to create a, a perspective view, again, it's just a matter of picking the relevant tool. We're going to create a camera view, pick where we want the camera, where we want to look, and then Revit generates that uh, perspective for me. Again, not too surprising. There's a lot of products out there, 3D products out there now that are generating this sort of information. Um, we can actually configure it a little bit further with some of the tools. I can create it as a shaded view, as we've seen. I can also apply some uh, viewport rendering, so realistic and ray trace. And again, these two options are not available in LT. We'll come to actual full rendering in just a second. Um, but I can also change it, uh, change the graphic representation to, um, I put ambient shadows on just to give it a bit of depth. I could put sketchy lines on, you know, just to give it to that sort of hand, hand type finish. So again, we can start to configure how we want our relevant views um, to be applied. Um, 3D views or perspective views aren't limited to just the exterior. We can also create um, interior perspective views like so. Um, this is just placing the camera in, uh, inside the model. Again, if we pick shade, we can just apply that shade. And again, the shadows, we can apply shadows. Um, with the shadow casting, we, we can actually configure it for specific times of day. Um, to generate that shadow cast. And we can also analyze that shadow information as well. Um, going on to rendering, we've actually got the ability to render in the full product. Um, so this is a, a quick, less than two minutes, well, 15, no, let's go to the draft. This was probably a better one. Um, this was like a 15 second render on this machine. So this is um, an i7 machine with 16 gigs of RAM and a two gig, two gig graphics card, and it can generate that sort of render within seconds. If you're willing to wait for best quality, um, that sort of thing took around about, uh, let's have a look at that one, I think. Yeah, that one was on this machine. That took around 40 minutes to render. So in conjunction with that, We've also got some cloud rendering capability, which is what Revit LT has got. So Revit LT can only render in the cloud, um, and you're, cl you're charged cloud credits for producing those. Um, general renders are around sort of two to five credits. Um, so a 360 render is something like this sort of quality, and that took 16 minutes to generate, and it just emails you when it's finished, and you just download that file. Um, but what we've also got the ability to do is things like um, illumination rendering, so based on the position of the sun um, and the loom, uh, the, the lux levels within rooms, um, you know, whether it's a perspective or a plan view and such like. So we can actually build up a whole set of information associated to how this building may work in its particular environment um, prior to actually building anything itself. And, you know, that's really the power of what Revit is about. That sort of brings me to the end of the demonstration. Hopefully you found that useful. And I haven't put my colleague to sleep. Are you there, Paul? No, I've not been to sleep, Steve. Don't worry. <laughs> Good okay. stuff. Um, over to you to wrap up, really. Lovely. Thank you very much for a fantastic uh, demonstration, as usual, Steve. Um, yeah, so next steps, really. It, it's all about you know moving you from your 2D process to a model-based design process. Now, if we look back at the you know, the polls that Steve took at the start of the of the, the webinar, I think Steve was it was it about 70% of the of the guys out there were on 
2D, LT, AutoCAD, etc. Yep. Is that about right? Something like that, yeah. Yeah, okay. So, so you know, it's quite a, you know, a transition to move across. So, what we see in our customer base where we're working with, with lots of practices and individuals like yourself to, to make that transition um, is a move towards um, one of the new Autodesk building design suites. So, if you can change the slide there, Steve, so that just pops up. That's it, lovely. Um, so really what we're talking about nowadays, when we're talking about building information modeling or model-based design, in terms of the software platform from Autodesk, we're really talking about the building design suite 2016. Um, I think as Steve mentioned earlier on, um, the 2017 suites are due out uh, in, in the next sort of couple of months, but for right now we can only talk about 2016. Um, and what you see, it comes in three versions here, standard, premium and ultimate um, and I would suggest that the majority of our customers are going towards the central column there which is the building design suite premium uh, and that really is because you've got full AutoCAD in there um, and you've got full what we now refer to as the Revit platform. Now the benefit of that is of course if you're currently using AutoCAD, AutoCAD LT, you've got a lot of legacy project data and, and no doubt a lot of legacy um, design data such as blocks and templates etc all set up within AutoCAD. Uh, so the concept being that you can then clearly access all of that information in your new suite of software um, whilst building up your knowledge and skill sets around model based design using the Revit platform. Now the key thing there and I think Steve again mentioned this earlier on, there's a distinct change now moving your head around Revit, whereas we used to have the three different disciplines in terms of architectural, structural and, and mechanical engineering or MEP, um, all of that content is now in the one platform, which is a really good move from Autodesk perspective, so it enables a whole model sharing and data sharing concept uh, when you're working on a collaborative BIM model uh, to just go along a lot smoother. So we see the majority of our customers going BDSP, as we refer to it, and occasionally, depending upon what your duties are on the project, um, some may have the occasional seat of ultimates uh, where you are needing to merge um, project data or 3D geometry, maybe not just from an Autodesk environment, but perhaps uh, other software or from environments like um, Bentley or Nemechek, etc. That allows you to bring all of that information into one area, aggregated, and be able to identify uh, potential clashes and collisions in the model prior to uh, issuing construction documentation. The other thing to mention, of course, that in both premium and ultimate, as Steve was showing you towards the end there, in terms of visualizing your model and taking it to the next level, if you like. Um, is that you also have Autodesk 3ds Max within there. So that allows you to link your Revit model to your visualization tool. And again, in terms of saving lots of time and effort, as you update your, your building model, then your visualization model will update accordingly in terms of all the material mappings, etc. Um, okay, Steve, what's the next slide there, chat? Right, so we've just spoken about software um, and being a bit of a, a paradigm shift now in the way in which Autodesk are conducting their software licensing business. Um, probably created quite a bit of confusion uh, at the customer level in the marketplace. Um, traditionally, as you'll be aware, Autodesk have sold licenses of software, which is called a perpetual license, and they sold with that and then a, something called previously a subscription in order to maintain that software asset at the current release on a yearly basis. Um, Autodesk as a business uh, globally are moving away from a perpetual license model and are transitioning to uh, effectively what are now called uh, subscriptions, just to confuse everyone, but really what we're moving to is a rental based model. So moving ahead to purchase new licenses, you will only be able to buy licenses on a term basis, that would be quarterly, renewable or annual renewable licenses, okay, um, and they've been referred to um, as desktop subscriptions and are now referred to as purely subscriptions, so you will subscribe to the software of your choice 
on a term basis, you will not be able to purchase perpetual licenses moving forward um, this year. For those of you that are on uh, perpetual licenses currently, with what was referred to as a commercial subscription, one is now referred to as a maintenance plan. As long as you renew your maintenance plan on its relevant anniversary, you will be able to continue to utilize your perpetual license asset. Okay, so that was all very confusing. Any questions on that? You've got my details on the screen to give me a call. Happy to talk that through with you. Now, of course, um, as well as the software side of things, uh, we're here to support you in that whole transitionary process of moving from 2D to model-based design. Um, so as a value-added reseller for Autodesk at CadPoint, obviously one of the core areas of our business is to work with you from a training and consulting perspective to make the implementation successful within your practice. So again, very happy to talk to you about how we've done that with our existing customer base. Normally what we see is a blend of, of training uh, to cover the basics. Typically we find that there are a couple of um, product champions or BIM champions within the business that want to take on the advanced topics such as uh, you know, uh, uh, Revit families uh, and uh, advanced skills using Revit. Um, we take those on and uh, work with them individually. We also then find having um, sort of intermittent workshops on projects to be a very useful strategy in terms of actually getting you live on projects. Um, and then in addition to those sort of items that I've just mentioned around instructor-led training, we also have a very good new product um, from Global eTraining which allows you to effectively have a full course installed on your own network so you can use that as a point of reference um, as you uh, go through your BIM journey and also to use it to train out perhaps new starters in the business at a lower overhead cost. Um, so really what we're all about at CabPoint is, is helping you out, making you uh, successful in your transition, providing the software from Autodesk and all of the relevant um, training consultancy and services that we can bring to the table uh, to get you going a, a, you know, a lot quicker than you would do by trying to uh, learn it all yourself. So any questions around that, please give me a call. Best number to get me on, uh, to be honest, is my mobile number. Or please feel free to drop me an email uh, and we can always arrange um, a webinar like this if required on a one-to-one -one basis or depending upon your location in the country or in the world, uh, Steve and I are more than happy to uh, come and see if you're serious about making a move to uh, building information modeling using the Autodesk um, technology platform. Uh, Steve, that's about it for me. Did we get many questions, chap, um, uh -huh. come in? There is one specific question, but what I'll do is forward it off to you um, about pricing more than anything. So I'll, I'll just uh, send that off to you later on. Okay, fabulous. Steve, is there anything that uh, I've missed during our session there that you want to, uh, to highlight before we, we wrap up? I don't think so. I think that was very conclusive. Um, and I think it's just to say thank you very much for your time and goodbye. Yes, well, thank you very much for your time today. Much appreciated. Um, do give us a call um, if you want to work with us. Um, details are there, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, and goodbye.